it's your girl Cheryl Lynn, and you're watching Speak the League on Alamo City Podcast Network. Hey, this is George Iceman Gervin, and you're listening to Sweet the League. I really feel like I should hit all of you guys up with the uh, I'm Lonely track because I've I've been, you know, pushed aside by Coach Geo, by The Rock. Obviously, Derek's not on Thursdays, but everybody's taking a vacation day. I guess they're celebrating Easter early today or not. We're giving it a day earlier for instead of Good Friday. But nonetheless, I am proud to be joined by a very, very special, special guest today. We'll bring him on here in just a little bit. We're going to talk NCAA basketball. It starts up again tonight. My national championship pick is still in there, but for whatever reason, I'm losing in my bracket. The bracket, you know, group that I I created, I'm losing in. So I don't know how that works. I thought if you do it, create it, you're the winner. But that obviously doesn't work in this instance. Not only that, we're going to talk about some athletics, but from high school to college stuff, anywhere from basketball to cyber gaming, because that's getting big into the collegiate eras as well. We're going to talk a lot about that. Plus. Video game nostalgia. We're going to go into some nostalgia video game because I didn't know that I was actually talking with a gamer as well. And who am I talking about? Well, it is our guest, Mr. Jared Zeidman. And Jared, you're welcome to sweep the league, man. You you got, I promised you, I was going to get crap about stuff. And I, I get Tim Gonzalez always gives me crap all the time. It says, dude, Budo Blue Devils and Tar Heel still suck. I'm a Tar Heel fan. I'm a diehard Tar Heel fan. There's majority Blue Devil fans in San Antonio, and they all listen to the show for whatever reason. Uh, not by my choice, obviously. I'd rather have Tar Heel fans on here. But this is what we uh, what we talk about all the time, man. But, Jared, welcome to Sweep the League. It's appreciate you being on, man. I appreciate you having me. I'm so so excited for this. Even, even just hearing you discuss what we're going to be talking about, I'm excited. Because yeah. I think we got a lot of eclectic tastes in the room. Yeah, we do. It, it's funny because we're gonna we're gonna go from like high school to college, NCAA stuff, and then we're gonna talk some nostalgia talk with some video games. Because guys, before we even went on air, Jared and I were talking, and we were talking about Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter and all this other stuff. And I'm like, holy cow, this is a conversation that we can definitely have on air because a, a lot of you old farts out there, like myself, used to play these games back in the day. And I'll tell you how much I appreciate it because there's nothing that makes you realize more that you are not the target demographic than mm -hmm. coaching young people every day, right? Oh. Like they don't get your jokes anymore. They don't watch <laughs> your stuff. You know what it's like as a parent. So like when you talk to somebody, you immediately connect on the things that you were both into. And it's like, oh yeah, I still matter. My The things I like are actually <laughs> cool. Like, yeah, it's the best. Man, I remember trying to download, and it was funny because I was on my Xbox uh, One that when my daughter has, and I thought, oh, they have Frogger from back in the day. Let me download Frogger. I downloaded Frogger, and I'm playing it, and I'm like, Miha, th this is the game, one of the games that we played. She's like, well, what's the point of it? Well, you have to get your frog to the other side of the street without getting run over or anything like that by the car. You know how hard it is to keep that frog alive? And exactly. She's like, Dad, this is boring. I want to play this. I want to play I'm like. I don't think you understand. This was a challenge back in the day because you would have that one car that goes slow. And all of a sudden, oh, I can make that. And all of a sudden, boom, it goes fast and you're you're dead. I'm like, there's no way to beat Frogger, man. So I'll tell you, on the subject of nostalgia, one of my favorite little recruiting tricks, because, mm -hmm. you know, when I started out, I was a younger coach and I would have to kind of prove to parents that I, I understood things from their perspective enough. So my favorite thing to do is I would look at the recruit and I would say, do you know? what dial up internet is Ooh. and I would just watch them panic. And then I would explain to them, like, oh, I want you to imagine a time where you had to call the internet mm -hmm. and the internet had to answer and let you on. And if anyone else in your home tried to use their regular phones, you would get kicked off the internet. And like <laughs> the most brutal fights you would have were about the use of the phone line. And like, that's how I would actually earn the favor of the parents. The parents are like, okay, maybe he is old enough to take care of my kid. Cause he knows what, <laughs> cause he knows what dial up internet, man, dial up internet, Jared, that. So, <laughs> so kids today don't know the heartbreak of, 
you hearing the static for the dial. You hear the do, 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 AOL. It's AOL <laughs> back in the day. You'd hear the static and you hear the na, 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 click, click, click. And then it's all welcome. And then if okay. you didn't hear that you got mail, you were screwed because it was either you got mail or goodbye. When you heard <laughs> goodbye, the the frustration of you wanting to grab the monitor, which these days monitors are this thin. Back then they were that big. You know, width wise, you wanted to grab the monitor, just throw it out the window or up a wall, man. Yep. They, they, they have no idea how good they have it. Meanwhile, now if something moves slow, it means it takes a second and a half to load. <laughs> While if we wanted to like listen to a song in its entirety, we would wait 45 minutes in our basements. Yeah, you, you the kids have Apple Music. We had LimeWire and Napster where we had to download overnight because God forbid everybody calls during the day when you're trying to download off LimeWire and Napster and you can't get the few songs that you've been trying to get to put on your burn CD because back then we had CD players and CD decks in the car, man. I'm telling you guys, this is all nostalgia stuff. Eric's in here. Man, Cincy, Cincy, Ohio in the house. I used to live in Cincinnati. Well, Middletown between Cincinnati and Dayton. Went to a lot of Xavier games. So thanks for joining, man, in Ohio. Appreciate you. All right, guys, again, we're talking to Jared Zeidman here. Um, we're going to go right into what you've got going with you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share the screen here for everybody to see. You may be wondering, you know, Jared Zeidman. Where have I heard him from? What is he doing now? We're actually going to share it right this very second. This is Jared right here. Now, he's got a cap on on the screen, but for whatever reason, it popped up without a cap. So we're going to kind of kind of scroll down a little bit here. But basically, you do a lot of recruiting. What you do is you're basically getting high school kids ready for that next level. And it goes yes. anywhere from, you know, training sessions. Uh, I've even seen where, you know, you're talking about income, everything like that. You're preparing the next generation of kids. One of the hosts on Sweep the League is Derek Irvin. He does a lot of the training side. He does a lot of that stuff. So what you're doing is you're basically taking a high school kid and saying, okay, to be prepared for this next level, these are the steps. Give our give our audience a basic background about what you're doing, what you're trying to accomplish, and we'll get on to the next level when it comes to you know, the actual recruiting process and stuff. Because when I was going through high school, Jared, it was you submitted letters. You had to do a VHS tape and submit that kind of stuff. It was easier. But these days, you've got to deal with parents that have a lot of say. You've got to deal with, you know, coaches who, you know, want this. And just so much goes into the recruiting process these days compared to back in the day. Yes. So let me let me bring you like from start to finish over kind of my why, because I, I think that you just touched on something very important, which is the disconnect. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of things about our lives and just the sports world have evolved. Technology has gotten faster. It's not tape trading anymore. It's uploading to something like a just play or a huddle service. Mm -hmm. But what hasn't changed is that sports themselves are actually still extremely old school things. You have to be resilient. You have to be tough. You have to be a great communicator. And what young people do not realize is talent is your cover letter. There obviously is a talent floor. You know, a D3 talent kid is not going to get recruited by a D1 coach. Mm -hmm. So there's a floor and a ceiling for each level. But what they don't realize, again, is that the talent is the cover letter. Your resume is how you communicate. Do you make good eye contact? Can you take coaching? Do you have a good attitude? To your point about parents, when I sit down with you as a coach and I ask you a question, are you answering the question or are mom and dad answering the question? Especially in this NIL era, do you have a handler? Can I even get the information out of you <laughs> as yeah. a coach? And what we're starting to find are two really interesting things. On one side, and you're probably hearing more and more stuff about this. Last year, 20% of division one men and women's basketball was in the portal. So that's one in five hoopers are transferring. So that part of the process isn't working because they're not finding the correct fits for themselves. On the other side, the transferring rules have now changed. So for the first time in modern, in modern college athletics, at least you can transfer multiple times without penalty. So now let's just say you're a college coach and you're thinking about recruiting an athlete. And you have a high school kid who's talented, but literally can't even make eye contact and finish a full sentence in front of you. The kid that visits, 
that visits your campus the next day, Rudy, they might already be a sophomore in college with two years of experience that already gets how this is. Mm -hmm. So what I'm starting to find is fewer and fewer high school athletes are getting that quote unquote benefit of the doubt. And I'm trying to equip them with the soft skills. Now for basketball, I can equip you with everything. I've got, <laughs> I've got 15 years of college coaching experience and I can get you right every end of the spectrum. But I also want to work with any athlete, not just basketball players on building up their soft skills, making them more growth oriented, making them more self-aware, teaching them how to engage better with college coaches and basically trying to get them to do this process themselves. I know I mentioned handlers before. I'm not a handler. I'm trying to get people to not use handlers and be a bit more old school. To your point, Rudy, mm -hmm. they got to take the initiative. They got to send those letters out. They got to make those contacts. You know, and bringing up points about parents, you know, we're talking to Jared Zeidman here. Uh, real quick, I got a book coming out. It's Nail, Nail the Recruiting Process. Uh, you can go get it. It's going to be available on Barnes and Nobles here. I believe it was April 30th uh, coming out on Barnes and Nobles. If you want to get it there, you can go to his website as well. It's nailtherecruitingprocess.com. Order the book as well as you can tell by the screen that we're sharing. You can order it there as well. We're talking to Jared Zeidman here. And the recruiting process, because I – I had an official that I talked to one time and I seen the same, another official on Instagram recently make a, a statement, basically talking about parents and being involved uh, at basketball games. And mm -hmm. they made the comment. I know exactly what tweet you're talking about too. Yeah, the very similar one is recruiters that come in, coaches that come in to watch your son, who may be a division one guy, five-star athlete, they're going to basically scratch his or her name off of their list if they see you're coaching them and the coach isn't coaching them. That's a huge thing this year, this year and actually in today's game because I'm at fault for it too. My daughter played basketball last year. There were times I was coaching her from the stands and I felt like, you know what, I need to step back and allow the coach to do her job because that's why she's the coach. But it is so hard these days because as parents, we have the mindset of, I know what's best for my kid. I know how to coach them. I played high school ball. The coach isn't doing this. Why isn't they doing this? We tend to insert ourselves more into the game. And it's a no-no. It's a big knock for the kids. It's a big knock for recruiting. How big of a recruiting problem is that? Because I'm sure coaches are coming up saying, are you going to listen to me? Or are you going to listen to mom and dad when you're in college? So you just said something really important. And I want to, I want to backtrack for one second and explain something because something that's really important to me, it's hilarious that we have this website up because obviously on the website, there's a giant picture of me. But when <laughs> I originally did my market research, one of the things that bothered me the most was like every recruiting book was just like an old white guy holding a basketball in a sport coat, like pointing at a person. And it was really important to me not to be that person. So something I want you and your listeners to know right off the rip is all of my stuff is informed by data. Um, I went out and I surveyed and interviewed 50 scholarship coaches. It was a balance of, um, excuse me, 50 coaches. It was a balance of scholarship and non-scholarship. But then I actually did phone interviews with a bunch more. And I've talked to dozens and dozens of athletes up to this point to kind of get every part of this covered. So mm -hmm. every basis of the recruiting process is covered. Now, I can answer this based on data, not just on my opinion. One of the most poignant things I learned was about parental involvement. Mm -hmm. Not only are coaches flagging over-involved parents, they are also executing very deliberate strategies on your visits to see how over-involved parents are. And I actually talk about one specifically in the book. Um, I would compare it kind of like to striking out in baseball. Coaches mm -hmm. will kind of give parents a little bit of grace for speaking for their kids, but then they'll actually intentionally test the parents and they will specifically ask questions to the recruit to see how either the recruit responds or whether or not the parent will jump in. And if you're a parent and that question gets asked to the recruit and you don't notice it and you jump in and you answer to the recruit, you better believe that that coaching staff is taking note and that they may back off. Um, when I asked coaches point blank, scale of one to 10, I'll continue recruiting a kid if their parents are over-involved 
the average response was a 4.5. So coaches are backing off when the kids have over-involved parents. The other thing, I gave coaches an open-ended question, Rudy. Besides play, like you go scout a kid on tape or you watch them live, besides their talent, what are you evaluating? 50 out of 50, 100% of the coaches replied something about attitude. And this included, do you roll your eyes when you get coached? If you make a mistake, do you look in the bleachers at your parents before you look back to your coach for instruction? Are you dapping up your teammates? So like, let's say your teammate travels. Are you the teammate that, you know, gives them crap for it? Or are you the teammate that high fives them and goes, all right, we got you next play. Mm -hmm. All that stuff matters. And again, talent matters. Everyone at the college level is talented. It's a coach's job to find talented kids. It's those other soft skills that are differentiators. And that's what the coaches are looking for. Absolutely, man. It's funny that you bring that up because recently on a show with the sweep, the league, Derek Irvin and I and coach Gio were actually talking about this. And that's, that's the attitude that you see from star players in the NBA. And we've seen how it trickles down to the college level to the high school level, to now, let's be real, man, to the CYO level. I mean, I you're you're seeing that role model mentality. Well, you know, if Draymond acts like this, if so and so acts like this, Steph Curry, James Harden, you know, taunting and celebrating. Oh, but you know, we're seeing Caitlin Clark do the same thing in Iowa. And, you know, when she's not getting her call, she's getting pissed off. We're seeing that at the high school level and down, down, down. Should it start at that top level? To because if you and I are still growing up, I mean, when we were growing up back in the day, we were looking at guys like, you know, Jordan's intensity. And, yes. you know, we also looked at I looked at guys, you know, from the Spurs roster, David Robinson, George Gervin as well. The mellow guys that would actually were ballers, but kept their cool. So it's got to start at that top level. Do you think those kids are today are affected by what they see on TV instead of actually crafting their game and working on the mental state of their own, making their own difference instead of watching these guys like Draymond and stuff. In the interest of not sending you down a five hour rabbit hole, I'm going to try to answer <laughs> this concisely. Rudy, you are so spot on and I'd actually like to blame one specific thing and I can reach for it right now. Sure. This thing. Mm -hmm. So, what frustrates me is that let's let's keep it about basketball for a second because that sounds like our wheelhouse, yeah. right? And you're you're in, in my opinion. I know we talked about this a little bit off air. You're in one of my favorite basketball cities in the world. There are plenty of great basketball mentors out there right now, but they're not the ones that get highlighted, or the things about them that get highlighted are the wrong things. Everyone wants to talk about Caitlin Clark's logo range or the fact that Steph Curry could literally hit a three-point shot from the moon. But because of our social media, no one really stops to think about the how. How did they get themselves like that? What sort of training and discipline did it take to get yourselves to that point? Instead, what you see on Instagram, especially, oh my God, it's brutal. Once any of these algorithms target you as a hooper, you see bad drills, you see is this a travel? Is this not a travel? You see somebody teaching you how to do five spin moves. You constantly, and I mean constantly, see bad attitude people get highlighted. And who are the who are the people watching it? Young, influential kids. So they see this stuff and they think it's cool. Oh, it's cool to shrug off a rep. Oh, it's cool to chest bump somebody and keep walking away. It's cool to try to punk the opposing player. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile... I'm in coaching circles and the, the video that I like, like, you know, that UCLA kid from eight years ago that has a teammate that's walking back on defense with his head down and he runs up to him and he points his Pushes chin up. He goes, nah, keep your head up. That kind of stuff. Um, our social media currency, Rudy, is really good at highlighting car crashes and really bad at highlighting the things that are actually important to your development. And 100%. that is the thing, the number one thing I talk to young people about is you should not be getting your advice, including your development advice on social media. Yeah, man. And you're right. You, you hit it 
right on the head that social media, I, I've always been one to say social media is the downfall of society. I mean, it's <laughs> yep. really killed society, to be honest. I mean, days when we would be able to get on the internet and, you know, it was cool at first, but now everything is online. Everything is showcased. You're going to see more people in fights. For every five, ten fights, you see one good thing. I mean, that's exactly what, you know, social media is these days. It's how many likes and how many views can I get? And you know what? Once I get these views and likes, how many followers will I get? Once all that comes into play, you've got the platforms that come in and say, golly, you're at 10,000 followers. You've got millions of views. Here's five grand a month. Here's 10 grand a yeah. month. So well, and and, and to your it. point about that development and growth. You don't get likes. Mm -mm. You get you, you get bruises for real. Like, and I actually just saw one of your viewers type in about how they used to grow up playing pickup. I'm with that. Everything is too organized for these kids. So they don't know what it's like to lose. And if they're unhappy with their experience, they just switch teams. Try playing pickup. Yeah. You have to win to stay on. <laughs> and if you and and also you have to be good enough to get picked. Yeah. And like all those things, like it sounds silly, but going through all those experiences and having some of those L's, they teach you resilience. Mm -hmm. So what I kind of see is because of social media, young people are able to dodge the resilience parts of development and it's actually making college harder for them. And again, mm -hmm. that's why I get so afraid of the portal. Because if you're a coach, and especially in this NIL D1 era, if you don't win as a coach, you lose your job. So it's it's in your best interest to find people who already get it. And social media has just put more and more high school kids in a position where they don't get it. It's not their fault. They didn't ask for it, but that's the problem. Yeah, that definitely is the problem, man. And you're right. Pick up games. I mean, when, when, I, when I was playing basketball, we would do a tournament, a holiday tournament. And, you know, hey, you got... You got medals. You got trophies for first place. You were a constant, you know, you got second place. You were a runner up these days, man. If I finish, my team finishes eighth place dead last, I'm still getting something from them. It's the whole participation thing. And I can't, mm -hmm. I can never get around that. And I know you're, you know, these days you can't be hard on kids and all that stuff. But for me, it's not being so hard on a player. It's teaching them that losing is okay because you can only get better from there. You know, when you're at the lowest level as an athlete, you either stay there and just move forward and maybe quit the game period, or that should entice you. That should motivate you to get better, to get to the next level. And I kind of say that too, as Chris Gallers in here. So I really practice so much in bowling so you can get better. I had never <laughs> practiced. I've never practiced a day in my life, to be honest with you. I just, I, if I practice, I would be a lot better. So that's definitely what I'm, I'm getting with that. But nonetheless, man, it's, the whole landscape of sports in general, from the pros down to, you know, the, the beginning level, the beginner level, it's all done a 180 degree turn. I mean, we, we try to go back to a certain era and you just can't. To me, it's already over with. You have to adjust to this type of era when it comes to sports. But with the, the kids that you teach, you... I know Derek has a lot of problems because he goes to tournaments and he sees kind of what I did. I saw a lot of kids there, you know, just talking smack and, you know, disrespecting the coach and everything <laughs> for someone like you that tries to get their mentality. How hard is it to get a player to come in and make them understand, look, you've got the talent, I'm not worried about that, but where talent is 40% of the game your mentality needs to be 60. How hard is it to get that player to understand you got to put it all together? So it really, it really depends on the kid and it depends on what they want. Something that's interesting, and maybe you can relate to this, you know, in some of your business ventures. Sometimes it's actually easier to work with the people that are either ice cold or newer to the process mm -hmm. or completely unmolded clay. And I would kind of compare it to what you just said about, like, there are some parts of it now where it is the way it is. Mm -hmm. So, like, if you've been at it already for eight years, 
there's probably less you can hear from me because you're so ingrained in doing it your way. And, <laughs> yeah. and that's okay. Um, what I tend, where I tend to start is by asking people what it is they want out of their experience. And a lot of times it's the people that are, Hey, I'm under the radar. I really, I really think I have a D one attitude. This is the feedback I've been getting, but I just haven't gotten an offer yet. Sometimes it's those people that are actually easier to work with because those are the people that are ready to just throw anything at the wall and see what sticks. Mm -hmm. And what I will say is there is one part of this where college coaches are guilty too. Um, there is a phrase that college coaches use to uh, kind of to vilify one another. And that phrase is called sexy recruiting and sexy mm -hmm. recruiting is a thing that definitely happens. And what that essentially means is they see a kid make a flashy play or a kid hit a really high degree of difficulty shot or somebody just make a super athletic move. That's a sexy recruit. And that's where I'm going to put my attention. So a lot of times there are these people that are not as flashy, but get all of the other things about the game right. And those are the kids that fly under the radar. So I would say where I'm actually most successful is with those types of kids. And interestingly, they don't always have those I'm the coolest kid in the room attitude yet because they can't hit the fadeaway. They, <laughs> they can't dunk from the free throw line. Um, and I actually explained to them, like, you have to understand that and I have literally said this to multiple recruits, your game is not sexy. And ultimately that is going to be very, very important to you. And by the way, as I talked to somebody from San Antonio, the least sexy game of all time belonged to Tim Duncan. Mm -hmm. And he is on the Mount Rushmore of forwards in the history of basketball. And I try to explain to people like your your ceiling is much bigger than you think it is. And as you get later in your recruiting process, like you're not going to get offered as a first year or sophomore because you can't do this crazy, sexy thing. But if you keep working and keep working on these virtues, trust that the spring of your junior year is going to be perfect because that's when all these coaches are going to realize how important you are as a solid player. And um, if kids are willing to buy into that process, that's where I see a lot of my success. So I love working with kids like that because they still have that hunger. A lot of times it's like, I hate saying it this way, but like it's the kid that got an offer as an eighth grader that thinks they're the coolest kid in the room. And all of a sudden they're a senior and that offer is gone because they've been carrying themselves like a monster. <laughs> for the last four years. You're right. And you know, it's, it's not back. You know, this is kind of weird. It kind of probably aged me a little bit more here. Well, before I get into it, Jay season here, cyber athletes getting up to $60,000 scholarships and paid internships for winning competitions here in San Antonio. That's what I was talking to you about earlier before the show. They had what's called the Mayor's Cup in San Antonio and seeing these high school kids. I mean, just hearing them getting, you know, summer internships and uh, paid internships where I'm asking JC, he was with me at the time. And I'm like, what do they get paid? He's like, man. They can easily come out, you know, out of high school making 80, 90,000 a year just for doing this stuff. And I'm like, holy cow, why, why why wasn't I able to just do this back in school? I can come out of my my high school thinking, oh, I got a paid internship. I can make 90K a year by cyber uh, cyber athletes. And cyber athletics is actually getting really big. Uh, definitely yes. something to check into uh, along the lines of actual gaming, you know, NBA Live or, or whatever they're playing. The kids are playing these days. But you know, kind of going back to me, I, I'm going to age myself a little. I saw the social media trend happen before the cell phone, before the internet blew up, uh, you know, any Instagram, Facebook. I mean, hell, we can go to MySpace from days. This is way before then. But I saw this change back when Slam Magazine got big. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you this. The reason why, because it was on the back of that Slam magazine, it had high school kids up and coming. It would rank high school players. Most people don't know Slam actually had Kevin Durant right, like number six in that high school class, being that he was probably the best one to come out of that class. He was ranked five or six, if I remember correctly. But one player in particular that had the hype, that was the guy 
God of New York City, Slam made him to be the man before LeBron was the man, and that was Sebastian Telfar. I'm so happy you just brought up <laughs> Sebastian Telfar. I was going to do it if you didn't do and, it. And this isn't this had this wasn't planned. Everybody out there, this was not yeah. planned. I guarantee. You. Talk, talk your talk while I sit here and smile. Please yeah. talk your talk about Telfar. Sebastian Telfair was the guy that social media, quote unquote, because it wasn't social media, but it was media driven by Slam Magazine, was that before around that time too, Lenny Cook was another guy. But Sebastian got the God treatment. Mm -hmm. And I was one of those kids growing up. I was one of those young guys growing up looking at Telfair like, this kid has it. I saw him play at the, uh, the, uh, the, basketball tournament here the world tournament here that they had during the final four weekend it was him jr smith josh smith uh, uh jordan farmar was another one there was a lot of guys that got together they played against the world team and i'm looking at sebastian i'm like golly this kid can play but again it's just against high school level guys and then him going straight to the nba didn't work out man and it, that's where i figured you know what from here on out I need to not be blinded by media hype. And now that media hype went from this to a gigantic bubble because it's social media hype. How is that? How is that time? We, that's the time frame we've gone from, Jared, is from, you know, seeing a kid saying this guy's got it to media pushing him to now social media making the average basketball player who makes a – posterizing dunk one time into the next best thing. Do I have your permission to get a little dorky and scientific here? You have my permission to do whatever. All of our hosts on this show get dorky all the time. Okay. So you're good. So there's actually a very specific thing that takes place uh, mentally that you're talking about right now. Um, it's, it's talked about extensively in one of my favorite books about development. And I actually, <laughs> I recommend this book in my book. To any young people and their family. And the book is called Mindset. Um, and it's by a psychologist named Carol S. Dweck. Um, but let me explain kind of. And I'll use Telfair as an example. For everything you just described. Sebastian Telfair was put in what I would describe as a fixed mindset. This is a kid. Literally a kid. Mm -hmm. Like dude I was getting lifted up in a chair. For my bar mitzvah and playing Madden at the same time that Telfair was being anointed the next major professional basketball player mm -hmm. at 13 years old. So if your mindset is fixed and you're done, you don't think you need to grow anymore, and everyone around you is saying you don't need to grow anymore, what ends up happening to you is you hit your first substantial obstacle and it feels mentally like you're falling off of a cliff. Because you don't know how to process that adversity. You've been, you've been so good for so long. And everything that's been reinforced in your mind is, I'm going to be great. 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 That all of a sudden when you're not great, you don't know what to do with yourself. I see this happen all the time with college athletes. And I don't know if you're aware of this, Rudy, but there is currently a mental health epidemic. In college sports, the NCA is actually putting a record amount of resources into trying to get their athletes more mentally apt. And it's because of this exact thing we're talking about. These kids, all because they're the biggest fish in their little pond, they show up to college and they hit adversity for the first time and they don't know what to do. So scientifically, there's a shift you have to make, which is you have to go from that fixed mindset of if I'm not the best, then I'm the worst. Kind of like... <laughs> Everyone's a walking Ricky Bobby. Yeah. Um, you have to shift to a growth mindset, which is if I fail, it does not actually impact who I am as a person. Uh, to steal a bowling analogy, if I throw a gutter ball right now, it's going to suck, but it doesn't actually mean anything about me as a person. 100%. I just have to, I have to figure out very quickly, logically, without using any emotion, I have to figure out why I threw the gutter ball and I'm just going to fix it on the next thing. And that is a mindset that takes a lot of practice. And it is the number one thing that I'm actually trying to get high school athletes to do. Um, I have an acronym in the book about the, the four data-driven personality types that help you get more noticed by a coach. 
And one of them is having that growth oriented mindset. So the, the word is gear and the G in gear is for growth oriented. If you can sort of get yourself now, if people start hyping you up and you have an ability to kind of be like, thanks, but also just kind of back off and I'm just going to get back to work and keep trying to get better. Mm -hmm. That will help you so much in the long run because then you'll hit that adversity or you'll show up on a college campus and you'll see a senior that's stronger than you and better than you, which by the way, makes plenty of sense because they should be stronger than you and better than you. They have three extra years of experience. You'll see that. And instead of having that emotional pitfall, you'll just be like, okay, I know what I got to do. Like I, yeah. I know where I have to go to work and you embrace doing that work. So that is actually a literally like a scientific and psychologically proven thing. If you can shift yourself to a growth mindset, it will help. And unfortunately, to your point, Rudy, the media makes having a growth mindset really, really hard. This is probably the hardest time ever to do it. So you'll do, you'd have to do exceptional and extra work to develop that kind of mindset. But I, I want to help you do it. Exactly. And, you know, it's kind of funny you brought up mental health because – we're seeing it unfold right, be right before our eyes in less than 27 days or so. The NFL draft is coming up. And obviously the the appointed generational talent, Caleb Williams out of USC, we've seen his mental breakdowns live on games, you know, on, on ESPN. And that is an, that's going to affect how a lot of NFL GMs, you know, rate this kid. I know he's projected to go to the Bears. I've never been high on Caleb Williams at all. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not more than just the mental aspect, but for me, being a quarterback in the NFL, it's got to be 80% mental because you are in control of that team on the offensive side, and your decision-making has to be not even instantaneously – it's got to be speed, like the light of the speed of light, basically, because you've got so much happening at one time. You've got to be able to have that mental that mental health in check. And that's something that I feel Caleb doesn't have uh, in check right now. Could it get better in the pros? I have no idea. I think if you have, don't have it in check by high school, you're pretty much checked out. Bingo. Um, I, I want to be wrong, but I share your opinion. I because I don't I don't wish ill on any athlete because I know what oh, it yeah. takes to be successful, but I think you're spot on. And I would recommend if anybody has not seen it yet, watch the untold documentary of Johnny Manziel on Netflix. Oh, that's and, a good one. <laughs> and um, I see some of that in Caleb Williams. Um, mm. the the impression I have of him through college is he doesn't have a lot of people in his corner that say, "Hey, that's dumb. Don't say that," or "Hey, that's dumb. Don't do that." And, you know, even just the way he's talked about not going to certain places if they draft him, like, who are you? Yeah. Like, exactly. don't don't say, like, why why cast this impression of yourself? And then, so, you know, I think about the Johnny Manziel documentary because, you know, Cliff Kingsbury, who's now out of NFL head coaching, basically owned in that documentary that like, yeah, we had plenty of opportunities to hold Johnny Manziel accountable and we just didn't do it because he made us all money and went and won us games and got us a lot of attention. And like, that's the impression I have of Caleb Williams. And I think that the thing that people tend to forget about professional sports, the most Rudy is the word professional. Mm -hmm. You have to be a pro in everything you do. Again, I want to be wrong, but does Caleb does Caleb Williams strike you as a pro? No, I I don't see him as a good pro, and it's sad because the kid is athletic. Right. He's definitely athletic. I will never deny that he's not athletic, but is he a pro? I don't think so, man. He's he has the mindset of everything is going to work out great for him. Everything's going to be good. The NFL is going to take care of him. Whoever drafts him is going to, you know, cater to his every needs. And it's just not like that. This, this is like going when middle school to high school, it's a whole different world, man. Going from high school to college, it's a different world. You have athletes already there that have been through the, the, the ringer already. They've been in the, you know, through everything you can imagine. And for you to come in and think it's going to be easy for you or you want to make it your way, especially in the pros, Jared, no, 
these veterans will eat him up alive. And they don't care. Why? Because in the pros, hey, brother, I'm getting paid to do my job. And if you can't do your job, I'm not here for you. You don't help me. I have to help myself. Anytime I've ever run a uh, camp where like it was high school athletes trying to either impress a college coach or learn more about college basketball and attend that camp, I've made sure to do a Q&A. And one of the questions that I have always deliberately asked the college athletes that were there is, is college basketball hard? Just so that the high school kids had, had an opportunity to hear people that weren't that much older than them say, this is the hardest thing I've ever done. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean I don't enjoy it. I love it, but it's hard. And I got to bring it every day. And then I usually um, bring up something that I refer to as the big reset, which is, okay, you're at this camp because you're in love with this, right? Raise your hand if you think you're one of the top three players on your high school team. And of course, everyone raises their hand. And I go, okay, do you get it now? Look around. Everybody's got their hand up. That means that you show up on a college team and everyone was one of the top three players on their high school team. Mm-hmm. Take that one level to the higher to the pros. It's even, it's even more filtered. We're talking about the top 0.1 of 1% of athletes on the planet. And it's funny that we talk about the way this works in America. You want to talk about how cutthroat professional sports are the NBA and the WNBA. You can make a compelling argument that they basically are looking at American college sports and going, yeah, you guys aren't even getting it done anymore. <laughs> yes. They're bringing in more pros from, from around the world. Speaking so professional, the professional level will always find a way to keep their engine running with or without you. And yeah. that's what you need to remember if you're an aspiring pro. Yeah. And you know, it's funny before we go to a quick commercial break, it's funny because what I've, I used to coach uh, a basketball for a little bit and I would always remind parents, I'm like, look, you know, because I've had the parents come up to me and say, I expect my kid to play division one ball. I expect my kid. I've had a couple of, i expect my kid to work hard to make it to the NBA. And it's like, you know, I tell them, look, I'm going to paint a picture for you right now to make it to the NBA, forget college, because if you don't play division one, you can go play division two. You can go to just a regular college. I mean, go wherever, you know, just a basic college. You can go play there. But for NBA dreams and aspects, 0.06% of basketball players make it to that level. Mm-hmm. And I flat out told him, your son doesn't even come near that 0.06. And I can tell you right now, just let him play. Let him play. If he works out, he works out. If he puts in the time away from me, he's going to get better. But I can't guarantee you. I've had one parent pull their son out because they said, you can't guarantee me he makes it to the pros. So I need to find a coach that will. Parents expect their kids because they scored 15 points in one game to be a pro sometime in their life because I hate to put it like this, man. And it's sad to say, but a lot of parents out there feel that that is their meal ticket to life. Mm -hmm. If my son or daughter make it to the pros, and that is a sad thing. We're talking to Jared Zeidman here. Again, Nail the Recruiting Process. That book's going to be available at Barnes & Noble's April 30th. You can go to his website, nailtherecruitingprocess.com. Order the book there. We're going to take a quick commercial break. When we come back, I promise you, NCAA talk, as well as some video game talk with Jared. We'll be back here in just a second. Locked on Spurs is your daily Spurs podcast hosted by Jeff Garcia, the lead Spurs writer for Ken's 5 San Antonio. Jeff has a healthy plethora of guests all the time on the Locked on Spurs podcast. You can also follow Jeff on threads at Jeff G Ken's 5 SA. You can also follow Jeff on Twitter at Jeff G Spurs Zone. So make sure you go ahead and give Jeff a follow not only on threads and Twitter, but also on YouTube at YouTube.com forward slash at Locked on Spurs. This is where you're going to be able to find the replay of the Locked on Spurs podcast. Make sure to like, subscribe, and share. Yeah, that is Jeff Garcia, Locked on Spurs, part of the Locked on Sports Network. Your your Spurs talk, definitely, Jeff, is the best out there. Uh, in my opinion, I'm on Locked on Spurs from time to time. I make guest appearances on there as much as I can so you guys can put up with my shenanigans. Jared, you, 
you've actually were telling me that uh, a lot of your coaching background, you you tended to to borrow. We're not going to say steal because we don't steal anything in our lifetimes at all. But you tend to borrow the uh, the wisdom of one Gregory Popovich, who I, the name sounds familiar. I think he's a coach in the NBA. I think he coaches here in San Antonio, but he's, he's kind of successful. This is a little bit successful there. I, I, apparently he won a couple of games or so, but um, you tend to have followed the pop coaching tree. So I'm going to let you give the, everybody the background on the coach pop stuff. But I, 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 I shocked Derek Gervin because we were talking about coaches and pop didn't come up for me. I said, Derek, when I was coaching, I, I, I coached, I, I followed Lute Olson, Gene Cady, Butch Beard. I read Butch Beard's book. I mean, these are the guys, and he's like, are you kidding me? I'm like, no, man. These are the guys that I liked following coaching. I Back then, Pop wasn't a coach. I mean, I had Don Nelson to follow back in the day. But, <laughs> uh, give everybody the, the background on the Popovich stuff here you were telling me. So long before my coaching career uh, started, I was into Greg Popovich because I thought he was sarcastic and I really liked his sense of humor. Uh, I don't know if you remember very famously, the Spurs opened up their season with a hack a shack four seconds into the game. <laughs> and then he gave Shaquille O'Neal a thumbs up, which was like, yeah. I, I saw that and I was like, okay, this guy's my hero. I don't, I don't know anything about him aside from the fact that, you know, he drafted Tim Duncan. He was great. And Pop was a great coach, even when it was, you know, Sean Elliott, Avery Johnson, uh, the Admiral, yeah. you know, on the, on the Spurs. As I got into coaching, um, I was getting into coaching at the same time where I thought, that the Spurs had their pulse on some really innovative offensive concepts. Uh, we're talking about young Kawhi Leonard, Tony Parker, Manu Ginobili, Bruce Bowen, Tim Duncan. Yeah. And the ball just never stopped moving. And it didn't get dribbled a lot, Just, but the ball movement was poetry. And uh, when I was a young coach in my mid-20s, I'm not kidding when I tell you this, I broke down dozens and dozens and dozens of hours of Spurs film to the point where my division three team, uh, when I got hired to be a full-time assistant coach for the first time, my first year, we ran almost exclusively San Antonio Spurs offensive concepts. And we had a great season. We actually finished second tied for second in our league that year. Um, we beat every team in our league that year. I still remember our team captains for that, uh, season, Kaylin Schmier and Amy Fisher. I love those two young women. They're the freaking best. Um, and we ran all Spurs stuff. Um, and I just kept learning. And so many of Pop's concepts, the way that he emphasized rebounds, his adjusted scoring and practices, even the way he called timeouts were integrated into <laughs> how I coach. So I am a huge, huge fan of Spurs, of Pop's coaching tree. It is. It should not surprise anyone. I mean, Becky Hammond was phenomenal not only just for the game of basketball, but for the city of San Antonio long before her relationship with Pop started. But it should surprise no one that she's also a great coach now coming out of that coaching tree. So a huge Pop fan. Over there. You know, I, I had dreams and aspirations, and I even thought about doing it one time of doing the uh, the Jerry Tarkanian towel chomp on the sideline because I, I mean, it was running Rebels back in the day, man, and Tark the Shark, you know, on the sidelines chomping on that towel. I thought, man, that would be kind of cool to do at a Tark high school towel. game. <laughs> but, man, yeah, Pop's a, pops great. It, it sucks because this season, obviously, is not a fantastic season for the Spurs. They've got a building block in Victor Wimbanyama, but you've heard people calling for Pop's job and Pop needs to go and this and that. You know what, man, as coach, I get it. If I was to open up, you know, back in the day, a newspaper that said Rudy's got to go, I understand it. It's part of the it's part of the business is what it is. And sure. you kind of got to say, well, does his coaching style fit today's game? That's that's what I wanted to ask you, because as a coach, I don't see it fitting today's game. But then again, there's a lot of different opinions everywhere. Yeah, I, I actually don't disagree with you at all. And I think, I mean, the the run that Pop has had is sort of unheard of, not mm -hmm. even just by modern basketball standards, but by all basketball standards. And I mean, you know, I think there's a the Kenny Kenny Rogers component to coaches. Mm -hmm. that you got to know when to hold them, know when to fold them sort of thing. Yeah, um, I think we're that Pop's definitely in his twilight. I think the game is different. I think the personnel is different. And I think, don't forget, you know, Pop is a military guy 
that started at the division three college level. Mm -hmm. And he probably can't even coach personnel the way that he wants to fully anymore. But what I think is the number one sign of a tremendous coach is you see people in other realms of coaching that worked under pop and maybe they have different offensive and defensive concepts and maybe they coach the game in a little, a little more modern of a way like a Steve Kerr or a mm -hmm. Becky Hammond, but their methods and the way that they value culture is the same way that pop did. And I think like in the same way that my favorite musicians are the ones that like 40 years down the line, you can still kind of hear the music that they made mm -hmm. in these new artists. I think that is the type of impact that pop made. He really is a, you know, Phil Jackson archetype, John Wooden archetype figure on the men's side of basketball. Yeah. And one guy that I really, I really tell a lot of people, look, when pop's gone, you may think, man, you know, great run, you know, great coach. I've always told people when pop's done, my, my coach to go to is Eric Spolstra, pretty much mm -hmm. the same type of coach just gets it done. And honestly, to be honest, Jared, I, I consider Spol the best coach in the NBA right now, period. Even you, over, pop. I don't, you would not get an argument from me about that. Um, a couple years ago, I might've argued Steve Kerr, but I, the ability you should be judged as a coach by your ability to consistently maximize what you have. Mm -hmm. And Spo does that better than any coach in the NBA, in my opinion. Yeah, Spolstra's, Spolstra's the guy, man. I've got him up there. Uh, I, I remember Derek calling me on draft night like, man, this Jaime Waquez. I'm like, he's going to be good, Derek. He went to the perfect spot in <laughs> Miami. Waquez is – he's the veteran that I wish the Spurs were able to have gotten to go along, you know, with some of their guys because, kid, man, everybody's one and done, one and done. And I'm like, I don't want the one and done guy. Just like in the NFL, Bo Nix is, what, seven years in college. But yes. – I'd prefer Bo Nix over a Caleb Williams, a Drake May, a Jaden Daniels. Why? Because, oh, it's not because he's old, but these guys that have been seasoned in the college game have been through so much in more years, like the four-year guys, Tim Duncan, David Robinson, a lot of these guys, they bring a different aspect to the game and the pros that you don't get from some of these younger guys. Well, and don't you get the sense that everything that the Heat organization does they do with a tremendous amount of intention, like even acquiring Terry Rozier, like mm -hmm. everything they do is how does this specific piece intricately affect everything else that we have? Yeah. It's just organizational masterclass. And I, I love coaches that think like that. I love organizations that think like and that. And it's, it's weird because Pat Riley's like one of the most hated guys behind the scenes for a lot of people. But I mean, the brilliance of Pat Riley uh, and Spolstra just keeps the heat, you know, in check the whole time. We're talking to uh, Jared Zeidman here. Again, uh, nailtherecruitingprocess.com. Go get his book. It's going to be available at Barnes & Noble's uh, April 30th. Don't want to miss that out. I promise you guys we're going to get into some NCAA talk here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to stop the sharing of the screen, and we're going to go to the NCAA side of things. Now, I don't, I don't want to do this, but I am. I'm going to have to – well, you know, I'm not going to share my bracket. We're going to screw that whole bracket thing up because <laughs> my bracket, my bracket is pretty much done. The viewers, the viewers, take it, take my word for it. His bracket is perfect. Oh, there is no. not a blemish on it. <laughs> I, I, I will definitely show the bracket here in just a little bit because it's, it's, it's pretty much done. But we recently we have the bracket now, and what we're seeing tonight is we're seeing, you know, Clemson and Arizona play the first game tonight here in a little bit. Uh, you got San Diego state, UConn, Bama, North Carolina, which I'm a Tar Heel fan, a manager Tar Heel fan. So of course going to Carolina there, Illinois, Iowa state, just running through the games, man. When we go to uh, Arizona, Clemson, if you want to give me a winner, we'll do winner, uh, winner losses here. Who do you have in Arizona Clemson? I like Arizona, mm -hmm. like Arizona for the Arizona Clemson game. Yeah, and Arizona for me, that's my national title champs right there. I, I've picked them before the season. I'm going to stick with them. Sadly, I think they're going to play Alabama, I mean, uh, North Carolina, because they're going to play against uh, the winner of that game. And I think Carolina beats Alabama. So you'll have uh, an Elite Eight game of Arizona, North Carolina. But that Carolina Bama game, how do you feel on that one? I don't, I don't, we're friends. 
Don't we're friends now, so don't get mad. <laughs> Based on the based on the struggles North Carolina had with Michigan State last week, for, yeah, I'm a little nervous about North Carolina being able to handle Bama's pace of play. Um, I I'm I like Bama on an upset here just with pace. I get that, and you know what? What scares me is that Bama had the toughest game in the tournament when it came with Grand Canyon, and I think. That was man. That that brought back the the bad boy days, man. That game, I I was excited to watch that game because you saw the refs swallow the whistle, let them play physical and, ball, right? Yeah. Physical adversity filled basketball. Yeah, these kids were looking around like, "Where's the foul? Where's the foul?" The ref said, "You know what? Are you bleeding? No, there's no foul. Then don't worry about it. Get up and play." So I think Bama was tested. This is the one team I'm thinking, ah, I don't want to see Carolina play after this kind of game. I wouldn't doubt if it happens, but I've got to stick true to my Tar Heel roots, and I'm going to go with North Carolina. Uh, San Diego, UConn, I I think, I mean, I'm taking UConn, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, one of the better teams in the country. Who do you have in San Diego, UConn? I'm, I'm with you right there. I think UConn's offense is scary good right now. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, it's one of those where I got to believe it when I see it. So like, I'm kind of picking UConn until somebody in the field throws a haymaker at them. Yeah. I've, I've got to take UConn as well. Uh, like I said, then you've got Illinois and Iowa state. Now I'm taking Illinois in this game. I I'm okay with Iowa state, but Illinois backcourt, their guard play, man, when they get tough, when they get hot, they are tough to beat. So give me Illinois in that one. I'm actually on the same page as you for that too. And I, I think to me that creates the, one of the matchups that I'm most excited about seeing through the whole tournament, mm -hmm. which is UConn, Illinois in the elite eight. Um, again, just fast, constant cutting, constant dynamic guard play um, should make for a great matchup. Yeah. And you know, I'm going to let you in a little secret here. Uh, I've got Illinois beating UConn and hitting Ooh. to the final four. So don't don't hate me, people of UConn, but uh, yeah, I, I've got Illinois beating UConn going into the Final Four. Just a a little heads up there. Uh, let's head over to the South bracket: Houston and Duke. I, why the Duke Blue Devils got this far, I will never know. That that team should just be an NI team only. I don't never like anything about Duke, so I'm gonna always pick against them. Even though I took Duke to make it to uh, the Sweet 16 in my bracket, I'm taking Houston over Duke. But something tells me that I need to put my hatred of Duke aside and take the Blue Devils because Houston has not looked good lately. Nonetheless, Jared, I cannot take a Blue Devil. Give me Houston over Duke. I'm, I'm happy you said that. Um, recency bias for me, too. I'm going to pick Houston. Um, this is this is the thing, and I... Uh, I, I hate cliches, but as, as I get older, I realize that every cliche is actually true. Houston is one of those kind of quote unquote built for March teams because mm. when in doubt, they can lock down defend and Duke has been enigmatic. So I will, I'll go Houston here. I still think Houston has a great shot at the final four. Mm -hmm. Although I don't, I don't want to get too ahead of you. I'm in, extremely enthusiastic about a Houston Marquette Elite Eight matchup. And uh Shock Smart is all, another one of my favorite coaches in the game. Yeah, and you know, I've I've actually got Marquette as well, Houston and Marquette in the Elite Eight. That's gonna be a very good game. I I mean, you're talking what Kevin Sampson and uh Shaka Smart, two great coaches uh for the game. But if you're going Marquette Houston, it wouldn't surprise me to see Marquette win. Even though I have Houston in the final four. It wouldn't surprise me if Marquette won. They, they've been looking pretty damn good lately. And I think that's one team to watch. So Houston Marquette, that would be a really good matchup. I'm really excited that I, I got called the A word, which ends in whole, because I said that Purdue had the easiest bracket of all. And people yeah. said, I'm a bum. They do not. UConn has it. Purdue has a tough time. I'm telling you guys. Purdue, for whatever reason, not being the number one overall ranked team or having the number one overall seed, why they didn't give it to UConn or Houston, I will never know. But for me, Purdue had the easier bracket. I'm taking Purdue over Gonzaga, and I'll just say 
the Creighton Tennessee matchup, it's kind of a toss for me. I took Tennessee, but it's kind of a toss up for me because no matter what, Purdue's going to make it to the Final Four. It's so funny that you say this. Um, you know, I'm and so let me give you. You mind if I stay on a soapbox for like no, twenty no, seconds? Go for okay. it. Go for it. So I come from the women's side, right? Mm-hmm. And the thing about the women's side is they they don't take your history into account at all, which bothers me so much. So like. There are incredible mid-major conferences on the women's side that get zero love from the selection committee. You can have an incredible season, like Fairfield goes 30-1. and one. They get zero love from the selection committee, and they're picked to play Indiana on Indiana's floor as a 13 seed. Then you get to the men's side. Mm-hmm. How, after what happened to Purdue last year, do they get the top seed? Yeah. I, and so I'm with you, and I'm a hater. Um. I think this is the easiest bracket for them. I think they win their next two games. They're in the final four, but I also think whichever team comes out of the South beats them. Yeah. In the final four. Yeah. I've actually got Arizona Houston uh, for my national championship game. And uh, like I said, I've got Arizona. If you got to pick one national championship, who are you taking? Oh man. Um, UConn does give me serious, like, 2007 Florida Gators vibes in mm-hmm. terms of their ability to repeat just because of how balanced their attack is. Um. Oh God. Yeah. I'm just going to be a total dud. I'm going to pick UConn. I'm sorry. <laughs> There's nothing sorry. Wrong what, a, about that. what a lame, what a lame <laughs> answer. Um, yeah. Sorry. Lame answer for me. No, man. Hey, there's no, there's no lame answers anywhere on this. I'm going to go real quick to the uh, the bracket so we can see how terrible I've done. <laughs> um, everybody seems to ask, how's your bracket looking? Like, it's bad. Well, ranking-wise, I am down here, number seven. So I have, what, 36.8% chance of actually winning the whole thing. Uh, we got our top seed, uh, whoever – I don't know who the screen names are, but they've got Purdue winning – but you see a lot of UConn there being picked to win. So UConn's a very popular pick. A lot of people expect them to repeat. I I don't wouldn't doubt if they did, but I just think that if they meet Illinois, that's going to take a lot out of UConn. That's a massive game right there. You're going to see, I don't know, man, that's probably going to be one, if not the best game of the tournament if Illinois and UConn play. From a, from a storyline perspective, I would love for UConn to win only because it then fulfills the prophecy of Danny Hurley really becoming the new coach K. And like, we really do have like a villain college coach again. Oh, I know, man. Golly. I'm glad you brought <laughs> coach K up because coach K has been, you know, the pimple on my ass for many years. And I'm, I was so happy when he retired. I'm like, Oh, thank God. I don't have to deal with this guy anymore. But right. Nonetheless, man. Hey, dude, Jared, I appreciate you joining us here on Sweep the League. It's been fun. We didn't get to any of the, the game talk, but uh, we'd love to have you back on. Get into some nostalgic game talk whenever you can, man. Yeah, I'm happy to talk video games anytime. This this was a blast. As long as you have me, I'm happy to come back and do it again. And, and really, I can't tell you how much I appreciate not only you highlighting what I'm doing, but the fact that you, with your background in sports, really sounds like you kind of believe in the same stuff about developing young people. So I really appreciate you, and thank you so much for having me. No problem, man. Loved having you on uh, again, man. You know, it's been fun. I love every single bit of it. You want to go ahead and promote what you got? Let everybody know where they can find you on social media. Sure. Um. So let me start by saying I'm, I'm kind of new to social media. So I've been blown away by um, how positively I've been received uh, thus far because I'm only like three months in. But you can find me at Jared the Coach, um, primarily on Twitter and Instagram. Again, that's at Jared the Coach. And then uh, the book and the website share the same name. That's Nail the Recruiting Process. Um, And then you can visit the website at nailtherecruitingprocess.com. Thank you so much for having me. And again, go San Antonio. You guys guys have some stuff figured out in San Antonio. I appreciate you. We do, man. We're we're not expecting any titles anytime soon unless you're just a massive Spurs fan. I think that, you know, we'll be able to get titles soon. But, hey, man, again, Jared, appreciate you joining us again. Follow Jared. It's at Jared the Coach on X. I used used to call it Twitter, but it's X now. Uh, Again, nailed the recruiting. No, no, no. You're good. I say Twitter all the time because they're just – you can say, well, tweet me this, but you can't say, well, X me this. It doesn't really – have the same vibe so go ahead and tweet uh jared zeidman over at jared the coach on twitter x whatever the kids are calling it these days know the recruiting process jared again appreciate you being on with us here at the league look forward to having you again man 
Thank you so much for having me. Take care.